So glad you are here today. We are starting a brand new series uh, in the book of Nehemiah. And uh, real quickly, we haven't done this for a little while. We have two churches that, uh, that uh, currently watch our uh, sermons in uh, Clovis, New Mexico at Servant's Heart Chapel. Pastor Daryl and Melissa Underwood up there, uh, out there, I guess I should say, and, uh, and then in Zanesville, Ohio. And uh, so if you would, why don't you give them a round of applause, tell them we're glad they're with us today, and uh, we appreciate them. So they'll get, be getting started with this series right along with us, and we're, we're in the book of Nehemiah, and we're talking about building something lasting. Nehemiah is a fantastic book, really of, uh, of just, uh, it's like a leadership development textbook. It's amazing principles and ideas and truths there, and I am really excited to, uh, to share this with you. But I am going to have to explain what the, the deal is uh, kind of as we get started here and give you the background of why this is even happening, what this book is even about. Because uh, as always in the scripture, it's best if you know the backstory of what's going on. So you do a little study, find out the backstory, and then you can understand a little easier, more easily, what uh, the situation is. So we're going to start reading. We'll read the first couple of verses of Nehemiah, and then I'll stop and explain, all right? Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to give you the background here. Here's what the background is. God's people, the Jews, had for centuries been living in the land of Israel. In the year 1446, the, uh, B.C., 1446 years before Christ, Moses led them out of Egypt. They journeyed through the wilderness. They conquered the land of Canaan. But very soon after the je death of Moses' uh, successor, Joshua, his people forgot his law. They forgot his ways and they stopped. They looked around and they wanted to be like that, that kingdom over there or this nation over there. And they started chasing after the gods of those other nations. And so as they, as they did, they'd chase after this god and they'd worship Baal or they'd worship Ashtoreth or they'd worship Moloch. And, and there were other god, these other gods of other nations that were false gods and they led them into horrible, horrible sin. God promised them, if you do this, I will come and I will destroy you and take you away to a distant land into exile. He told them it was going to happen. But like most of us, they were pretty stubborn hearted. And even when they knew what was coming, what God said was coming, they still wanted to do their own thing. And they did. And they did it for a long time. God was incredibly patient. He sent prophet after prophet after prophet to tell them and warn them. Every generation, there were people God would raise up to speak the truth to that generation. But they would not listen. And so, just as they, in fact, actually after Solomon, God tore the kingdom in half and the northern ten tribes of Israel and the southern two tribes of Judah split off from each other and the northern kingdom never even had one good king who followed the Lord, not one. And in 722 BC, 700 years after, approximately after their exit from, uh, from Egypt, the, the Assyrians came in and wiped out and, and just destroyed the northern kingdom, the ten tribes. Now, some, a remnant of some of those fled and survived. There were a few from those tribes that did survive, but the northern kingdom never existed again from that day on. The southern kingdom, Judah, lived a little bit longer. They did have a few good kings that would turn their hearts back toward the Lord, and, and people like Josiah and, and Joash and, and guys like the Hezekiah that would, would turn the nation's heart back toward the Lord. But then as soon as that king would die, the people would go back right back to their idols. And, and uh, it, it was a sad, sad process. process. So they, left a, they lived a little bit longer, but in the year five, 597 B.C., Babylonian army came sweeping in to the, uh, into the land of Judah 
and they conquered the land of Judah. Now, at that time, the Babylonian army did not destroy the land and destroy the kingdom. They came in, installed Zedekiah as the king over the land of Judah, and basically said, you're ours now. You're Zedekiah, you're going to rule, but you are our people. You are conquered by us, and you're going to send us uh, taxes type thing. They would have to send uh, huge gifts and things out to, to uh, the Babylonian empire. But a few years later, Zedekiah decided he was going to get smart, and he was, going to, he was wiser than God, and even though they were under this bondage, because of God's judgment, Zedekiah said, I think we can throw this off, and he rebelled against Babylon and formed an alliance with the king of Egypt. So Nebuchadnezzar came back, and in 588, 589, and up through the year 586, he laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. Now, in those days, they had big, thick walls around Jerusalem, and, and so you couldn't just randomly come up and open the door and go in and conquer a city, or you couldn't invade. It wasn't like Oklahoma City or whatever city. Uh, it wasn't like that. They had walls to, to do defense in those days. And so you couldn't just come up and conquer the city easily. You had to tear down the walls or whatever, and, and that was a hard process. And so they, uh, they, what they did was they just laid siege to it. They came up and they would build siege ramps up against. They'd build dirt higher and higher and higher until they could try to get over the top of the wall. But mostly they just camped an army outside the city and starved them out. And it was absolutely a horrific, horrific process. People would, in, in the final stages of that, of that thing, God, God said, I'm going to bring such judgments on you that I'll cause the ears of everyone who hears about it to tingle. He's like, basically, you're going to feel it, ooh, like a chill go down your back when you hear the horrors that they went through. And it was horrific. People eating their own children to stay alive. It was absolutely horrific in those, in those, uh, those days. There is a story that happened in those days uh, that is recounted in one of the prophets where, where it was, there, there was people agreeing, okay, we'll eat your children this week and next week we'll eat my children. It absolutely, and I've, I've got chills right now because God said that was going to happen, right? He's like, it, it's horrible, the judgments I'm going to bring upon you because you have forgotten and forsaken me. In 586, finally the city fell, the, do the gates burst open, and Nebuchadnezzar stormed in. Zedekiah, the king of Jerusalem, was captured. He was forced to watch all of his sons murdered, and then they put out his eyes and took him away as cap captive to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar sent an army back down to the city, even though it was conquered. He sent an army back down. He tore down all of the walls of Jerusalem. He said, they're never going to rebel against me again. He tore down all the walls of Jerusalem. He destroyed Solomon's temple that had been built by King Solomon. And they allowed a small group of the poorest and least, uh, least advanced Israelites to stay. He allowed a small group uh, to stay there and basically kind of prevent the city and the land from being taken over by wild animals. So they would work the land, they would, they would uh, do a little bit, they'd farm, just kind of scratch out a little bit of, uh, of living, but it was not a good situation. In fact, they took the smartest and the best and the most educated people, and they took those off to Babylon. You've probably heard of the three Hebrew boys, right, or, or that, that were in the fiery furnace, or Daniel and the lion's den. All of those stories come from that group that was rounded up, the smartest, the most educated, and they took them off to Babylon. So basically, they left the poorest, least educated people. They took away all of the treasure and all of the riches. They ripped down their defenses and said, good luck to you, and left and went back to Babylon. They were in Babylon for about 70 years, for about 70 years. So, you know, roughly two or three uh, generations of people are born during this time. In, uh, some, sometime in that 70 years, there was an official edict by Cyrus. So the, the Babylonian kingdom fell, and it's, in its place rose the Persian kingdom. And a Persian king named Cyrus found that he was named as the man who would restore the kingdom 
Uh, and so he, he allowed, he was named centuries before, actually, in the prophets. And he was, the Hebrew people brought him these writings and said, you are named here uh, as, the, as the man who will be the person who brings our kingdom back to life. And so he signed an edict that said they could go back, Jews could go back to Jerusalem. But it, these things take time, and they, they kind of gradually did. One group went back um, under Zerubbabel, a guy named Zerubbabel. Another group went back with a guy named Ezra, whose book is also written uh, in the Old Testament. But they were still just scratching out an existence. I mean, they go back in and there's nothing to work with. The walls are uh, are torn down. The gates are burned up with fire. They don't have tools. They don't have what they need. They're barely existing. So, we are now about a hundred years after the destruction of Jerusalem. And we jump into this book of Nehemiah and we find a man named Nehemiah who is the cupbearer, it says, uh, in verse, uh, in, uh, verse, I guess it's three, verse three, he is the cupbearer of the king. Now, what that meant was that he was not, some people said, well, the cupbearer, isn't that like a butler who just brings the king his food? You're like, here's, my, here's the, your food, king. No, it, it really wasn't. The cupbearer was an important, um, an important office. He would taste the king's food first to make sure it wasn't poisoned. But he would eat with the king every day. So in other words, if the food was poisoned, he would taste it. He would die, but the king would live, right? So, but since he was supposed to be there in the king's presence and he would taste the king's food and then the king would eat the food after that, he was there all the time and it became one of those things where at mealtimes, the king would talk strategy, he would talk politics, he would strategize about how to build his kingdom and the cupbearer then had to be a significant trusted advisor who had to be there and hear all this classified information, right? And so he's a, he's a, a really influential guy, an important and coveted position. Now, I want I to start today by just highlighting this idea. When you, maybe you feel like in your life you've kind of been... Well, a lot of stuff has been torn down. You know that, that there's a lot of things in your life and you look at your life and you're like, I think I feel kind of like those exiles who were back in Jerusalem. Like we're barely making it. We're scratching together. We're trying to make a living and scratch it together and, and s- just survive, you know, but there's no, how do I build something that lasts? How do I build something where there's a legacy, where there's, I'm leaving my kids something better than just scratch out a bare existence and barely make it through? How do I build something like that? And the answer to that question is leadership. That's the, that's the answer to that question. What is the difference between two uh, two football teams, one that barely makes it to 500 or doesn't quite get to 500 every year, and the other, the other one that, that is consistently a powerhouse. Well, the answer is leadership, right? And, and if the football team doesn't make it over the course of time, a college football team, let's say OU for the next three years barely made it to 500, the first thing they do is fire the new coach, right? I mean, he's gone. He's good. That's not happening, right? And, it, it, leadership. John Maxwell, leadership uh, author, one of the well-known leadership authors in the world today, says everything rises and falls on leadership. And that is generally true. Now, you say, well, I thought everything rises and falls on God and on faith in God. Well, yes, that is true if the leadership is godly. Right now, I'm not just talking about random leadership, I mean godly leadership. If you want to do well with your business, you're going to need good business leadership. If you want to do well in your finances, you're going to have good financial leadership. If you want to do well with your family and with your spiritual life, you're going to have to learn to be a good spiritual leader. And so Nehemiah is like a textbook. It's amazing. It's a textbook on what to do to lead something that lasts, to lead change that is permanent and that leaves the next generation better off than the current one. And so if you want to do that, if you want to influence the next generation, if you want to leave something better, this, I think, is going to be really helpful 
uh, series for you. Before, my, my tagline for today is before anything will change. Right? Before anything will change, there's three things that's going to have to happen. Nehemiah is a, is, 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 hears about the bad news. Some guys come back from Judah. You're right, so in those days, you couldn't just pick up your cell phone and call back to Nehemiah and say, hey, Nehemiah, I just got here, and man, this place is a mess. Instead, they'd travel to Judah, and then they'd be, you wouldn't hear from them for months or years, and you didn't know how things were going. And so somebody travels back to Nehemiah, and he comes back to him, and he says, Nehemiah says, hey, welcome back. You've been in Judah. How is it in Jerusalem? And the news is not good. And the guy says, well, let me tell you, honestly, Nehemiah, it's, it's horrible. It's bad. There's no leadership. Nobody, like, it's, it's just these people that have kind of existed like animals, and they're barely, barely surviving, and there's rivalries and fighting, and there's other people coming in that want our land, and we're continually having to watch out because we have no defense. We have no walls, and there, there's, no, there's some powerful men in that region who are rich and wealthy, and they're trying to push us down and keep us down, and Nehemiah, it's bad. Nobody, there's rivalries, and nobody knows what to do, and so Nehemiah hears this, and I want you to look at number one. Before anything will change, you're going to need to find, if you're taking notes, you're going to need to find your holy discontent. You're going to need to find your holy discontent. Everybody say holy discontent. What do I mean by holy discontent? Well, look at verse 3. He said, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. And for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah hears the news and he is crushed by what is happening. He is heartbroken. His stomach, he, as he hears it, knots up. And he's like, no. Jerusalem? The great city? The city of the great king? The, the city of David? The city of Solomon? With the huge walls and the temple? and the, it's, it's what? It's broken. Now, you remember, Nehemiah had never been there. He was born as a slave in Babylon. He's captive. Now, he has risen through his wisdom and intelligence and good advice. He's risen to the place where he's at, but he's never seen his city where he's from. And he hears this, and he's like, oh, no. Let me tell you something. Hear me now. Until, until you are torn up about where things are, you can't go to where things are better. Until you see what is going on and you're like, no, I'm not okay. There's a, there's a, a, a cartoon character from years past. How many of you remember Popeye? Anybody remember Popeye? All right. And there was this moment, there was this moment in a Popeye, in a Popeye uh, uh, story where he would... He would come to this place, like he'd kind of be, you know, the, the bad guy would kind of be giving him issues and have, he'd have, he's having problems and they're being mean to him. And, but then they'd capture olive oil or something, right? And all of a sudden, Popeye would say, there was a line he would say, anybody remember this? That's all I can stands. I can't stands no more, right? And I just got to tell you, there's got to be this place. And then, of course, he would open up a can of spinach, right? I just got to tell you that some of y'all, when you look at your life, you've been beat down and defeated and you're like, oh, I guess there's nothing I can do and it's just the way it is and the devil's just going to beat me up and I guess this is how it has to stay. My friends, there's going to have to be a moment where you look around at what the devil has taken from you and taken from your marriage and taken from your family and taken from your kids and you see your kids making this deci these decisions that draw them off and turn them aside and you see your, your, your situations 
in your life and they're going south and you don't like how your you, temptation comes and you don't like how you're able to stand against it, you're like you're barely hanging on and bare, there's going to have to come a moment where you stay that's all I can stands, I can't stands no more, and we're going to open up a spiritual can of spinach, and we're going to do something about this. And Nehemiah, he, it, sometimes even before you get to that point where you're mad, you get to that point where you're just broken. You know what I'm saying? You're just broken. And you're like, oh God. Some of you know that feeling where you're like, oh Oh, God, my husband, my wife, my kids, my family, my, I, my, own, my own heart. Oh, God, I'm not okay. I can't do the fine anymore. I can't do it. I'm not fine. And you've got to find that moment where it hits you like it hit Nehemiah. For some days, look at his reaction, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. you got to sit down and say, Lord, I am done with just saying, well, I guess this is what it is. I guess all kids take this, this detour into, into evil. No, no, I'm not okay with that. No, the devil can't have any of my seven. He can't. Mourn, fasted, and prayed. I remember a time, I remember a time where I sat down with my wife and we were saying, we were like one of my kids who shall remain nameless was, was not, it was not okay, all right? There was rebellion and hard heartedness there and there was anger there and it was, it was, I'd say, do this. No. And this is not okay. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I believe in corporal discipline, and I'm willing to spank, and I, it's fine. You know, I, I don't believe in hurting or beating kids, but I do believe in discipline and, and, and maintaining discipline, and it's controlled, and it's appropriate, and it's processed with them and taught well and all that. Use it as teaching moments, not as anger moments, right? I believe in all that. So, so I, I did. I took, I, we took disciplinary action, and, but but. Sp- it wasn't working. Like spankings were making him matter. I said, now I said him. Oh no, now you know. All right. But I've got six boys, so you still don't know which one. So, so it was making him more and more angry and hard hearted. It was like he'd get more. The Bible uses the word stiff necked for stubborn. You know what I'm talking about? Like stiff necked. Like, and it was stiff necked. I mean, like literally, it was stiff necked. And I. What in the world is going on here? And Liz and I, we said, this is not okay. This is not okay. I'm not going to lose this battle. Not at this age. It's not happening. We called our parents and we're like, hey, can you pray for us? I called my, she called her parents. I called my parents. Like, can you pray? And we're, we started praying and fasting because I'm not okay. I'm not okay with the devil establishing a stronghold in one of my kids' lives that he's going to use the rest of their life to attack them. I'm not okay with this. And by God's grace, I don't have time to tell the story today, but by God's grace, God moved in through the Holy Spirit's work and broke that stronghold. And it was different from the day that happened. It was different. But there had to come a moment where we said, I'm not okay. Now, dads, listen to me. This is a moment where you stand up. Sometimes spiritual leadership, we think of leadership as like, I'm the boss. And whatever I say, that's what they do. And I'm going to say, do this. And they're going to do it. And when I, de- when I say, when I decide, when I put my foot down, it's the end. That's no, there's no more discussion. Let me tell you something. Sometimes spiritual leadership looks like Nehemiah here first. It looks like, oh God, no, what is happening? You got to help me. I'm not okay with my kids going to hell. I'm not okay with my marriage falling apart. I'm not okay. And so men, sometimes the best thing you can do to stand up and lead is go on your face before God and say, Lord, I can't, I can't, I can't do this. I can tell them and boss them and they don't make them want to do it. Right? You heard the story of the little boy, little boy who said, that, you know, he was sitting in the corner. He was sitting down in the corner and he said, I'm sitting down, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> Well, now, here's the thing. 
That's cute and funny and fine until they're 15. You know what I'm talking about. And when they're 15, you can't have it that way anymore. So you've got to win that one when they're four, right? You've got to beat that one. When you've got you to win that battle when they're a lot younger than 15, right? There's got to be a want to that happens. And that's a spiritual thing. You can't do that. You can't do that with a whipping. You can't. You can't make them want to obey. You can make them outwardly conform, but the last thing you want is an 18-year-old who has been outwardly conforming for 10 years and then moves out of the house. It's not going to go well, right? It's not going to. So you've got to win their hearts, and that's a spiritual thing, and you've got to be willing to find your holy discontent and say, I'm not okay, and I'm going on my face before God until something changes. Right. Now, there's a difference between just discontent and holy discontent. Okay? I'm, when I say discontent, I'm not just being like, uh, I hate my life. All right, that's not what I'm talking about. All right, uh, I just wish I had more money. Wish I had a nicer house. Wish I had a nicer car. I've met some people who were just discontent, and that's not really what I'm talking about. You can be thankful and have a holy discontent, right? You can be truly glad and thankful and have a heart that says, oh no, no, I'm not okay with that. What's the difference between discontent and holy discontent? Here it is, if you're taking notes. Discontent is based on my comfort. Holy discontent is based on my desire for God's glory. Okay? This is important because uh, years ago I read a, something by Charles Finney, and Charles Finney said a lot of people pray for their kids because they think, wouldn't it be nice if my kids were Christians? Oh, it'd be nice, and we could all be together, and it'd be friendly, and we wouldn't be mad at each other. But that's just praying based on your own comfort, right? I'd just like my life to be better. <laughs> I'd like for my life to not to be so hard. But he said, do you understand that what they're doing when they, when they rebel against you, it makes your life more difficult? Yes, but he said, do you understand that when, they re when they're rebelling against you, they're rebelling against God? And that's what matters. You don't want them to go to hell. You don't want them to dishonor the name of Jesus. You don't want them to crush their life on the rocks of sin. You gotta, so it's not about your, your own comfort. It's about your desire for God's glory. Nehemiah's life was already comfortable. His life was already pretty good. He had risen about as high as you could rise as a slave, right? He wasn't necessarily free to suddenly randomly leave. The king would have liked to have a word with him about that. But his life was pretty comfortable. He was eating at the king's table every day. Wasn't any better food in the land. But when he heard that God's name was being profaned among the people he was part of, his heart was wrecked. And some of you need to let God wreck your heart about where things are. Now, a while ago I said, dads, you need to rise up and find your holy discontent. But ladies, listen, okay, in case your man doesn't, or in case he's not there, then we need some moms who will say, I will be powerful in prayer on my knees with God, and I will be mighty there. I will. All right, let's keep going. Number two. Before anything will change, you've got to find your holy discontent. Number two, you've got to pray with complete honesty. Look at verse 5. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps His covenant of love with those who love Him and obey His commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant as praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. By the way, if you get woke up early in the night or you can't go to sleep late at night, pray. Make the devil regret keeping you awake, all right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I, there have been times I, I could not sleep one year, one year before Easter Sunday. I could not sleep. It was like one in the morning, like, oh, like, all right, fine. I got up. I went out to the, uh, I went out to the, to Walmart. And I invited two cashiers to come to church the next day. <laughs> and then I came back over here to the church and walked and prayed for an hour. And I was like, Devil, you're not going to do that to me anymore. By the way, he's never done it again. <laughs> Easter Sunday, I sleep fine the night before. And he's like, yeah. 
I, I sleep fine because if he's going to keep me up, he's going to regret keeping me up. <laughs> All right, you've got to pray with complete honesty. Now look at this. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. You ever confess to God in prayer? Just being honest? Lord, I'm not trying to hide something. I'm not trying to turn my good face side toward the camera. You know, like I'm not trying to fake it. No, I'm just saying, Lord, I've sinned. I've done wrong. Now, there's a, there's a scripture verse that says God resists the proud. And the word is he shoves. He shoves the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you'll humble yourself before God, and you'll admit, Lord, I can't beat this on my own. I can't fix my marriage on my own. I can't make my kid's mind on my own. I can't, I can't build a solid relationship with my girlfriend on my own. I can't stand boldly in my school on my own. I can't. I need you, and I've done wrong. If you'll confess like that and pray with complete honesty. Look at verse 7. We have acted very wickedly. Boy, he's going real with this, isn't he? We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon... I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. You ever remind God of things in prayer? You should. You should. Lord, I'd like to remind you about some things you said in your word. <laughs> now, does God, has God forgotten them? No, but it's good for you <laughs> to remind him. It's good for you. And it reminds the Lord that you know them, right? Lord, I'd just like to tell you, I read that scripture. You know that one, Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I remember that you said that, Lord. Lord, you remember that one that said the promise is for you and for your children? I remember that you said that, Lord. Lord, you remember that one that said, if my people will humble themselves? I you remember that? Lord, I remember your promises, and I'm laying a hold of those promises today. I'm, I'm going to cash in some of those coupons today, Lord. And I believe that you're going to honor your promises because of your faithfulness. Let's keep going. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Notice he's focused on God all the way through this prayer. Like, we've done wrong, but you're good. Lord, you're good. We've done wrong, but you're good. And you have promises. And I remind you of your promises. Number three, pray with complete honesty. Number three, ask for big things. Ask for big things. Big things. Ask for big things. Verse 11, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And he says, and I was cupbearer to the king. You see what's happening, right? He's going to go in front of the king and he's going to ask some big things. He's going to ask that God give him success in doing something that is going to cost the king money. He's going to go ask the king to give him money. It's going to cost the king people. He's going to say, hey, king, I'd like you to, ta to give me um, a whole bunch of people to travel back with. And also, king, I'd like you to send guards, uh, like a regiment of soldiers with us to guard the way so we won't be bothered. And I'd like you to write letters to all your... It's going to cause the king all kinds of issues for that. But he's asking, he's going to go before the king and he's going to ask him to do big things. Now you know this could go south for Nehemiah, right? Like it could go way, way south. And I know in your life there are some things. I know this is true. I know that in your, in your marriage there are some things you're saying, if I go to my husband and I ask him this, or if I say that, or if I say, babe, I, want to, I, I, I feel like this needs to happen. I feel like we need to do this. I, I know that it may seem like there's some real questions. Like, I don't know. I know if you say, if I talk to my kids about, about the Lord, if I, talk to them, if I really put that out there and really start trying to train and teach them, I'm afraid I'm going to fail. I'm afraid they're going to be like, ha! if I go and if I try to go and witness, if I try to share, if I try to conquer that sin, 
that has held me captive. I'm going to fail. But my friends, God is motivated when you ask big things of Him. God is moved by that because it takes great faith to ask great things, and God is moved by great faith. I, I've said before, I'm afraid that some of our prayers are almost insulting to God by their smallness. You're coming to the creator of the universe who loves you and is crazy about you, <laughs> who gave his own son to save you. You're coming to the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and who said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And all you can think to ask him for is a good day? <laughs> oh God, just help me have a nice day today. <laughs> and I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. I think some of you need to stop asking God for a good day and ask him to rock your world and turn your life upside down and change your family and save your family and save your marriage and pick up the pieces and put them back together and change everything. Lord, set my family on such a solid rock that six generations from now, my great, great, great grandchildren are still pointing back and saying there was a mom, there was a grandma, there was a dad, there was a grandpa that changed his life and everything changed. My grandma, Grandma Stetler, she was not raised as a Christian at all. She never went to church. When she was seven years old, she found out there was a God. Like somebody mentioned God, and she had no idea what they meant. Like that was her family. And one of her family members, somebody said, she heard him say, you better be careful, God keeps a record of everything you do. And when she heard that, she was like, what? God? keeps a record of everything I do, and she said, it was like, I want to know more about that. There was a man who, who in, in God's faithfulness, there was a man who felt impressed to sit down and write my great-grandmother a letter, to write her, my great-grandmother Lamb a letter and explain in that letter the plan of salvation. And my great-grandmother was so impressed by this letter that she gathered the family, the kids, into the, the room where she was at. She said, I want to read you this letter that somebody wrote us. And they all sat down on the floor and she read them this letter about how to be saved. My grandmother said she didn't really understand it at that time, but she said, I heard it and she said, in my heart, there was born a deep longing to know God. And she said, I never, I never went to church until, the, until I was 12 years old, and God, in His faithfulness, worked it out. So my great-grandpa Lamb, who was not a believer, who was a hard-hearted man for years of his life, he was, he, he, in, when he was in grade school, there had been a girl, there was a situation where some bullies were picking on him, and some girl who was a couple of years older than him, took up for him and kind of went to bat for him a little bit, kind of like watched out for him, and, and, and he remembered that. And years later, that, that girl, now grown up, was in his, moved into his town where he was living, my great-grandpa Lamb. And while, when she moved into town, she started going to a church. She was a Christian. She started going to a church, and she met my Grandpa Lamb and invited him and his family to church. And he came home and told his family, we're going to church one time. He said, we're going to church one time. He said, she was nice to me in grade school, and I owe her at least going to church one time. By the way, you never know how God's working behind the scenes years before anything happens to put pieces together. So they went to church. The preacher preached a gospel message, and nobody, nobody invited my grandma to, the, to, to come forward and pray. But he opened the altars. If anybody wants to come pray, they can. A few people came forward. They came to my great-grandpa Lamb, and they came at the, and talked to, her, talked to him and invited him to, to church. He got mad and said, no, I'm not going to go. He got mad. To, I'm sorry, they invited him to come forward and pray. I said, come to church. They invited him for him to come forward and pray and give his heart to the Lord. He said, no, I'm not going to go. He got mad and wouldn't go back to that church anymore because they came and talked to him. But my grandma said when she heard, when she saw that and she said she saw him say he wasn't going to go, 
And she said, the first thought that went through my mind was, Dad, if you're not going to go, you better get out of my way so I can. So she slipped out. She went down front. She knelt down. Nobody came to pray with her. She was 12 years old. But right down the altar, just a little ways, there was somebody praying with somebody else. There was a, a, a woman praying with another person who was a few feet away. When I get to heaven, I want to meet those people. But anyway, she was, she was kneeling there and she said, let me tell you. She said, do you know how to pray and ask the Lord to come into your heart? And they said, no. And she said, you pray like this. And she said, dear Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. And that person said, dear Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. And a few feet away, my grandma heard and said, dear Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. She said, I'm sorry. if you'll forgive me, I want to live for you. If you'll forgive me, I want to live for you. My grandma got saved at 12 years old, just hearing somebody a few feet away tell somebody else how to get saved. She stood up and she said, it scared me. She said, everybody had it look like they had a new face on. She said, I was like, what, what happened? She said, I, I went home and she said, it was like the trees had new leaves on them. And it was, it was, everything was like it was a new start. She said, I, I went and I, I found, she found somewhere, they never went back to church actually. She never went to church regularly until she was 18 years old because none of her family went. They lived way out on a dirt road in North Carolina. She was, uh, she was as she grew up, she was um, just, uh, she, she would go out in the, in the, in the yard, out in the, in the yard and back a little path into the woods to a big rock out in the, in the woods there and she'd sit up on that rock and she said, I would just talk to God. She didn't know what else to do. She said, I just talked. I didn't know what, how to pray or whatever. She said, I just talk with God, which, by the way, that's what praying is. Just be honest with Him and just talk with Him, right? She said, I would just talk with God. She grew up. She got to be 18 years old, and she got graduated from high school. She said to her, her dad, I want to go to college. And her dad said, no, women in our family don't go to college. A few, day, a few months later, he died of a heart attack. And she said to her mom, Mom, I'd like to. She got a hold of a copy of God's Revivalist, which is a small magazine put out for years, for a hundred years, by the college that where I attended college. God's, Liz and I met there at God's Bible School and College in Cincinnati. And she got a hold of a copy of this and she said, Mom, I want to go to this college in Cincinnati. Finally, her mom said, well, you can go. So she went. She showed up there. She met a sandy-haired boy. And uh, Ken, named Kenneth, Kenneth Stetler, and she married him, and the rest is history. They had six kids. Those six kids are all over the country and all over the world, preaching the gospel, serving as missionaries, and Bible college presidents in Florida, and, and missionaries in Mexico, and pastors in North Carolina, and Indiana, and, and Oklahoma City. She's got a grandson. That, uh, yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you what. Here's, what am I saying? I'm saying that if God can find somebody, even if it's just a little girl who's 12 years old and never went to church and never is able to go to church, but he can find a heart that is willing to love what he loves and hate what he hates and follow after him as simply as, he, as you know how. God can take something like that and change the entire course of a family and turn an entire generation of people. The next generation doesn't have to be like the last one by God's grace. So what I would say is this. Would you stand up in your life and say, I will be the Nehemiah of my generation. I will lead. Whether anybody else does or not, I will lead toward God. I will lead toward heaven. I can't stands no more. I'm going to find a pit spiritual can of spinach and we're going to eat this thing and we're going to beat the devil up and we're going to build something that lasts. If you'll do that, if you'll lead like that, God will change things. He will. He will. I want you to bow your heads together with me for prayer.